world, you got to do what you got to do, you know. But I didn't really couldn't see burning that much money on the budget buying, you know, two thousand dollars worth of shims. Huh? Yeah. Compressor, accumulator, and an orifice tube, or an orifice tube built into that line. So that stuff's gonna be here this afternoon. So anyway, yeah, his, his compressor. If you turn the AC on, the compressor clutch clicks in and it just slips. I mean, it's the it's, you can turn the compressor pretty easy, but the clutch is destroyed. Is what it is, and you can't get you know. Okay, let's jump into uh, test number one here. <clears throat> this is uh, drivetrain test one, and these are these are true falsies. You know, not a big deal. Uh, the guys that have done transmissions, you'll be able to answer this off the top of your head, uh, intrinsically. An electronically controlled automatic transmission uses a complex hydraulic system to regulate shift timing. Is that true or is that false? The answer they're wanting in that book is that an electronically controlled transmission doesn't have quite as complicated as a valve body as the other one. That was the conventional wisdom when this book was, you know, actually initially published. False is the right answer, but true is the answer I would put if I was doing the if I was taking the test because. The little Renault Alliance and Encores had an electronic transmission. And the little valve body on that thing was about the size of your hand and it had three or four valves in it. It's just, it just plumb simple. But it was electric, electronically handled, you know. But the, the ones that like a, a Daniel and uh, them that did that car of Abbey's, that valve body was not uncomplicated, was it? It was a complicated valve body. There's a lot of valves and stuff in it. A continuously variable transmission allows the engine to stay within its power band. True or false? Why why was it that back in the uh, 1960s most cars even if it was a stick and you remember these would have a, unless they had overdrive uh, if it was a stand, manual transmission they would have like three gears three on the column you remember that one two three three on the tree that's what they'd have and so the farther you go into your uh, into the 21st century you've got more and more gears. You notice that? I mean, the transmissions have got more and more and more gears. Yeah, so that the, what they're always trying to do is they're trying to keep the engine operating within one particular little band, one particular little power band. Now, I was telling some of you guys the other day that Ford actually has a transmission now they've got in some of their 12 focuses and stuff. It's a manual transmission, but it's fully electronically shifted. And it's got two input shafts, two clutches, and it's got these little... Uh, Whenever you look into that tra electronic transfer case, or you'll see this little spiral thing that moves, a, you know, spins around and moves the fork and all that. And so it actually, you've got two pedals on the floor, and you got, it looks like an automatic, and it is automatic, but inside of it is the gears that you see in a manual transmission. Well, they they don't. The same concept as like the paddles here, and the clutch and everything. Yeah, I'm sure it's probably rooted in the same deal. But the, the, the long and short of it is, you have actually got. Uh, this continuous variable transmission is the ultimate number of gears. You know what I mean? I mean, it's got it's only got it's got a lot of different ranges that you're going through really, really fast. Transverse mountings are primarily used on rear-wheel drive vehicles in which the engine is mounted side to side. Is that true or false? True. What's transverse mean? Side to side. So if it's a rear-wheel drive vehicle, it's not going to have a transverse engine in it, is it? In other words, if the engine is running, what they call that is, if it's running from the front to the back, they call that north-south orientation, and if it's running east to west, you know, side to side, they call it east-west. Uh, but transverse mountings are going to be on front-wheel drive vehicles. Uh, and remember this, guys, the engine always turns the same way that the car goes. On some Honda cars, the engine's in there backwards, like on some of the Civics. You know, you walk up to the driver's side of the car, you're looking at the timing belt, that sounds screwy. If you're used to looking at the timing belt on the passenger side, always remember the engine's going to turn the same way the car would go in that direction. That way you're not confused if you just walk and look at it. Now, if I walk up in front, look at the front of my Bronco or, or Daniel's pickup truck, and I'm letting the engine run, which way is it turning? I mean, if I'm looking at it, and I'm standing in front of it, and somebody starts it up, which way is the engine going to turn when he starts it up? No, you're walking up looking at it. Clockwise. It's clockwise that way, but when you're sitting in a vehicle, it's turning to the left. Now, there was a car in the early 1960s, all through 68, they made it called Corvair, 
it was an air-cooled V, I mean, a horizontal opposed six-cylinder. I had one of them. It was the first car I actually legally drove, you know. For, before I had a driver's license, I drove all kinds of stuff I wasn't supposed to be driving, but I had a 55 Chevy pickup and all this. But that Corvair, the engine turned backwards on that one. It was a reverse, you know, turn back, turn the opposite direction. Huh? Well, my dad uh, used to had his shop out here in Daleville, and somebody says, do you work on Corvairs? And he says, uh, if I work on a Corvair, I'll have to do it with the shop doors closed, and it's summertime, it's kind of hot. And they said, why would you have to have the shop doors closed to work on a Corvair? And he said, because if somebody sees you working on one, they'll bring you another one. And he didn't want to fool with those of it, but he worked on them. Although the composition of ATF, excuse me, and longitudinal mounting, hey, you guys, what are you talking about over there? I'm talking about engine action. Yeah, and we'll talk, I mean, uh, if you need the floor so you can talk about it louder and make sense. You know, yeah. I would actually like only if it only if it contributes to the test we're trying to get through with before lunch. Okay. Okay. All right. In, in longitudinal mounting, the transmission or transaxle is mounted front to back. I may have to send you to the principal's office. All right. And uh, we do have a principal here, and she will straighten you out. I guarantee you. You know. So, I don't need to go to the principal. Uh, well, you better not. Although the compo composition of ATF has changed over the years, most automatic transmission fluids can be used in all vehicles. That is absolutely false. You better make sure you're putting the right kind of ATF in there. A technician that orders transmission parts needs to know the model and year of the car. I would say that's the truth. I don't know why in a Sam Hill the answer key says that's false. I mean, I think they're figuring, well, you need to tag off the transmission and all that, but I've never ordered a transmission part without telling them what your model car was. I mean, every time I've ever done that. We used to have one guy named Gary Butler who would come in there to order transmission parts, and he said, I don't want your model this truck is or nothing and all that, but I need this part. I mean, like the parts guy is supposed to be able to read his mind or figure out what he got. Yeah, I mean, that's when I was working over there, they'd say, make sure you leave the year. Make model in year. Well, see, maybe what they're uh, getting at, like Webb pointed out to me, yeah, that's he's he's got a good point, but at the same time, you're still going to need to know the year and model of, make model a car. I mean, even if it has two or three different transmissions. Now, when you'll tell them, like on Abby's car, see Abby's car was a was a '96 uh, Taurus. We've got a '96 Sable that looks just like it, except it's a Sable, and they got two different transmissions in them. So, I mean, it's one's an AX4N. Which is what she's got, and then the other one's an AXOD or something like that, I think. But anyway, um, there are no, let's see, I don't, who cares? Let's keep going. Um, let's see, uh, petroleum based ATFs offer better durability under higher temperatures and better lubrication qualities than synthetic ATFs. And you military guys probably used to use automatic transmission fluid on your machine guns, didn't you? To keep them things lubricated? All right. Let's see, uh, viscosity additives, additives keep the ATF from becoming too thick at low temperatures and too thin at high temperatures. That's true. Common foot powder or a black light can be used for finding the source of an ATF leak. You spray that thing with the Dr. Scholl's and it's, you see that oil, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show up. Uh, the clutch disc is also called a friction, friction disc. Now, if pressure plate exerts force or pressure against the clutch disc and clamps it against the flywheel. Remember that from last semester. Woven asbestos linings were used on older vehicles, but are no longer used. False. That's false because you're still going to see asbestos clutches. All that, um, and that's uh, you know, and what is that that you get from breathing asbestos fiber dust? It's a mesothelioma. You see a lot of lawyer commercials on TV talking about that, don't you? Um, everybody knows that you don't use an air blower to blow the dust out, right? It's just not. Yeah, I get it. Use something wet. So the wet dust can't fly. Uh, let's see, uh, mechanical clutch uses linkage, excuse me, a mechanical clutch linkage uses a series of rods and levers to engage and disengage the clutch. Um, that's going to be true. And then cable linkage is used on uh, front wheel drive and rear wheel drive vehicles for the clutch. Yes, that's true. As a matter of fact, sometimes uh, on some of the Mustangs and stuff we would have, you'd see a, a bad clutch cable that would cause an issue. They kind of got away from clutch cables in now in this day and age. Most of everything is being used hydraulically now. Yeah, NASCAR has a clutch cable. Yeah. Huh? Mine has a clutch cable. Well, that that is an ancient car. And it sticks. Yeah. About halfway. Yeah, but you probably need a clutch cable if there's one that's available anymore. And uh, I watch it is new. You gotta push it really, really hard, and it sticks sometimes. And it's just rough. Really. It's just rough. Maybe it needs to lubricate it with some graphite or something. Yep. 
Um, hydraulic linkage is used where other types of linkage cannot be used. What is the advantage of hydraulic linkage, guys? Why don't we use linkage on our brakes instead of hydraulics? I'm not even sure what hydraulic linkage is. You get more force out of the hydraulic. Hydraulic linkage is an oxymoron. Actually, yeah, you can actually change a lot of that. But the other thing is, if you can put a slave cylinder over here, and a master cylinder over here and snake a line over there to it. You can make something happen over here without having to worry about cables and pulleys and <laughs> see, what, see how much easier it is to make it work. I mean, it's just, it's just sensible to do it that way. Uh, now, I saw that uh, Donnie Hughes had this uh, had this Hudson 50 model Hudson over there at his shop, and it had a backup system that was mechanical brakes that would kick in if your hydraulic was failed. That was in 1950. You know, they, I don't know why they came up with that. Out. They just trying to be a belt and suspenders thing, I guess. Um, okay, what was the first car, American-made car, that came out with disc brakes? Remember? What do you think? It was the Tucker. You ought to watch that show as a movie with Jeff Bridges on it called Tucker. Now, he only made 50 of those things, but he was spanking GM and the rest of them with his ideas, and they put him out of business. That was, uh, and he had disc brakes. That thing would go. Uh, it, yeah, Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. That was a good. That was a good show. All right. He also made a military vehicle that would go 100 miles an hour and was air conditioned and was bulletproof. Yes, but it was not feasible enough. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Army Quartermaster said they didn't need anything on a battlefield going 100 miles an hour. <laughs> okay, but anyway, we got, okay, all right. I was doing the Zach thing, getting off track here. Okay, we got, uh, yeah. on the rear-wheel drive vehicles, the engine or transaxle must be removed to access the clutch. Hello? Hey. Uh, he was here, but I don't know where he is right now. All right. Um, okay, now then, we're going to have, um, let's see, back over here. False. Huh? Is 16 false? Yeah. No, 16 is actually false, yeah. What is 15? On rear-wheel drive vehicles, wait a minute. On rear-wheel drive vehicles, the engine or transaxle must be removed to it's access the clutch. Wait, hold on. That's actually true. That's actually true. You're going to have to either pull the engine or the transaxle one. Well, the reason that they're claiming this is false is because a rear-wheel drive vehicle technically doesn't have a transaxle. Yeah, you're, you're making a good point there. Yeah, that was a screwed up deal there. Before a clutch is installed, that was a trick question is what it was. Before the clutch is installed, the surface of the flywheel and the pressure plate must be oiled. False? That's totally false. If you oil it, you're going to have a chattering clutch. Is that what I'm saying? Huh? 15 minutes is true. 15? That's actually true. It's true. Okay. It's true. true. I'll yeah, no. He messed up. No, uh, if the clutch pedal is stiff, the driver may be using it improperly. Uh, but you know, clutch pedal pulsates the engine, and transmission may not be aligned. That's true. Uh, you know these dowels that you yeah, have that you, whenever you're putting the transmission in, you got these old stiff dowels. That it, it, they're either actually hollow dowels that bolts go through, or there'll be solid dowels. Mm -hmm. And what happens? You're, the reason those are there is because if without those dowels. The engine and the transmission will start doing this and the bolts will work loose. Did you know that? So it, if you're trying to put one together and it ain't got no dowels, you better go find you some dowels. You're going to have trouble later. You ever seen that happen? Yes, I have. I saw it happen on a daggum motorhome uh, that we were test driving because, it, uh, believe it or not, it came in for a speedometer problem. And what we found was that the transmission was loose. And the reason the transmission got loose is because somebody had put it together without the dowels. And uh, you could tighten it up, and it would loosen up again. That's what you got looking for. That. You got to put them dowels in there. Them dowels have got to be there, guys. Anytime you see dowels, they're in there for a reason. You know, you might say, well, I don't have the dowels. I'm sort of messed up. Sometimes, like cylinder heads will have dowels so that when you set them on there, you know, they won't slide around and all that. So, uh, so if the clutch pedal's stiff, the driver may be using it improperly. What do you think? What are you smiling about, Willie? What are you smiling about? <laughs> No, that's not. That's false. You know, yeah. it is not the customer's fault if the clutch pedal is stiff. Uh, I tell you what happened. Used to, if the clutch pedal slipped, somebody put one of them high performance zoom clutches on there. Them things be so stiff you can hardly match them. You ever get one that's like that? 
You can't even hardly get your foot on the plate. You can't even push it so stiff and all that. Uh, aluminum has a higher specific heat capacity than steel. That's true. Now, I will tell you, there was a uh, big truck that was a uh, that we worked on down there that I talked about one time. And it was a Lotus Star 1800, and it had uh, two transmissions in it, and um, which sounds kind of like something I'm making up, but it didn't. It had a transmission bolted up to the engine, and it had a little short drive shaft, and behind it, it had another transmission that was a four-speed. And so you could actually select four different ranges. Now, the rear transmission didn't have reverse, but it had four different ranges. And so it was a, it almost seemed like a military thing almost, you know what I'm saying? But it had a, uh, but you could start it, if you put it in that lowest gear in that auxiliary transmission, even when you got up to the highest, to the fifth gear in the main other transmission, you still weren't going about 25 miles an hour. <laughs> I mean, it was super granny low. Well, these yo-yos were always messing the clutch up. They burned the clutch out on that thing. And I had to get on that big old monster, you know, the bunch, everybody drove it on the dock up down there. I had to get on there and get a, and we didn't have no right good transmission jack down in there. We had to get a big old, uh, if that thing fall on you, it's over, man. This is a big, heavy transmission. It probably weighed, you know, 800 pounds or something. But it'll work it out there with a jack and all that. And finally, I asked the guy at the, the parts house, I said, can I get you to build me a clutch that will not burn out so quick? You know, so he actually put some brass buttons on there that were made for landing clutches with. And on that one, when they abused it the same way that they usually did, they busted the pressure plate and the flywheel all to pieces. So I could, couldn't win. I was going to have to put a clutch in it about once every two months, you know. And I, I put a bunch of clutches in that thing. And not to mention a clutch in a Chevrolet pickup about every 30 days. And we had a bunch of Chevrolet pickups down there. I got where I could do that in 30 minutes, you know. <laughs> Pop it in there. Uh, the Sprague and Roller Clutch are two types. Of, this is test two, by the way. The Sprague and Roller Clutch are two types of planetary gear sets using automatic transmissions. That is totally false. That is the, that, those words are wrong. Clutch is gears, I mean. Yeah, there's plenty of gears. It's the combination of rotary flow and vortex flow that actually makes the torque converter function. That's true. Some of this stuff you just sort of burn in. See, you're, it's a burn-in thing. If a stator one-way clutch problem is suspected, a stall test or a bench test can be run. That's actually true, a stall test. How would you bench test a torque converter to see if the stator one-way clutch was bad? You know, you're going to actually turn it. Well, basically, what is a stator one-way clutch won't turn but one way. Yeah. And so you can actually tell if it's, you know, if it's locked up one way and turning the other way. But you can also do a stall test. A stall test is when you lock over it, lock off. Uh, well, Jeremy had trouble doing that without trying to burn the tires off the Bronco. But you got to lock that thing down and have everything good and solid and put it in drive, go all the way to the floor, see where the, see where the engine stops gaining speed. That's your stall speed. If the stall speed's low, then the... Uh, stator one-way clutch is, you know, not good. That would mean the stator is able to turn both ways and you don't get tor torque multiplication that way. The Simpson gear set is the most common type of planetary gear set. Is that true? All right. Answer that next one, Zach. Number five. Read it out loud. Lock-up tug will refer to a vibration that occurs during the plot or release of the lock-up clutch or after the lock-up occurs. Is that true or is that false? He said it was false. What do you think? Everybody like that? Yeah. That's false. All right, let's go with that one. The stator, chuggle, when you see the word chuggle, you know you're going to be talking about a GM. GM loves the word chuggle. I ain't heard nobody else use the word chuggle. I, mean, I may be wrong, but I ain't seen chuggle in no other book except a GM book. Um, the stator one-way clutch can fail only if the clutch is constantly locked. That's totally false. Number seven. Most planetary gear checks are simple visual inspections for damage and wear. Sure. What can cause your planetary gear set to fail early? Any idea? In an automatic yeah. transmission? Huh? Really well, I mean, what I'm saying is what can cause, the, cause it to fail. I mean, that, that's a way it can fail. But what is it that can cause it to fail, can you think of? What if something moves or what if something happens that starves it for oil? It needs lubrication. Those little gears have got to be well lubricated. Mm -hmm. If something moves around and starves it for oil, and on some of the Nissan transmissions that we would work on, like that RE401, uh, they have they had a half, high uh, number of um, planetary gear set failures. And what they would do is uh, these transmission gurus that were just, all they did was eat, sleep, and breathe transmissions all the time, you know, would found the hole in the separator plate between the valve body and the transmission case where the oil was supposed to go to lubricate the planetary gear set. 
and they would have you to get a particular size drill bit and drill that hole out just a little bigger. And that would give it a better oil supply and it would be less likely to burn up. Now, how many of you seen on these automatic transmissions, the ones of you that have done them, you'll see the drum where the clutch is stacked in there. And Daniel, you may remember that. They've got a little ball in there that's sort of rattling around. Now, what is that for? Check ball? Well, it's actually a... It's, uh, is it like uh, picking up debris or something like that? Well, not really. But, I mean, what would happen if you got centrifugal force and that, those little drums are spinning really, really, really fast in there. And some of the early automatic transmissions would basically keep, because of the centrifugal uh, force throwing the fluid out, would keep the piston applied and cause those clutches to, you know, partially applied and cause them to slip and they'd burn. You know, you'd go into two gears at once and it would burn the ones up that weren't applied the most. And so what they did was, uh, my uh, shop foreman said that he kept seeing C6 transmissions in police cars and stuff that would burn the that one particular clutch pack out. And so he went to transmission school and the Ford guy that was teaching the class, he says, that was a really sharp guy, you know, he knew the transmissions really well. And Philip says, why am I, am I seeing so many of those uh, C6s burn up like that? You know, he says, uh, how many have you seen? He said, probably a hundred. And so he says, all right, well, take this, uh, everybody's have to take this C4 transmission part, put it back together. And so when Philip got through putting his back together, he had a part left. And the guy said, why do you have a part left? And Philip said, that doesn't fit this transmission. It goes in a C6. I'm telling you, I've done 100 of them. He says, and after I recognized that part, that guy started talking to me. <clears throat> he says, take that drum that's burning up. It didn't have that check ball and stuff at this time. He says, and get a drill bit, this particular size, whatever it was, 16th of an inch drill bit, and drill a hole in it. And that way, when that fluid is slung out there, when that drum's still spinning real fast, that hole will bleed that pressure off and it won't keep those clutches applied and burn that thing out. <laughs> well, now they put that little ball in there, you know, because they know it's going to be spinning up, and that little check ball, which is kind of like you're talking about, lets the fluid drain, you know, lets the pressure off, you see, you know, whenever it's spinning up like that. Anyway, so I just wanted to make sure that somehow I've managed to lose my way here. Which one are we on? The Ramino gear set operation is the same as for the Simpson gear set. Is that true or is it false? False. Ramino is, what's the difference? The name. Huh? The name. No, there's different. They've got different more gears and stuff in there. You know, you got uh, multiple gears. I mean, um, on, it says that if you look at the Ravino gear set, the way it operates on these uh, videos that we saw, uh, I would say it's slightly different. But you know, the the basic principles of any planetary gear set are going to be the same. Um, uh, number nine, the primary cooler for fluids in the transmission is located beside the transmission. Where is it? In the radiator or in front of the radiator. Uh, number 10, the most common type of in-vehicle test is a converter leak test. Sure. That's actually false. But I will tell you one thing. Um, this is something I want you to, uh, and I may have forgotten to tell you last semester. Occasionally, you're going to run into a situation, I've seen this, where you'll see a bunch of fluid coming out of the bell housing area, transmission fluid coming out of the bell housing area, dripping all over the uh, floor. You know, you obviously got a transmission leak from the bell housing area. All right, so what's the thing that comes to mind first when you're leaking out of the bell housing area? Huh? Well, not, I mean, transmission fluid's what's leaking, huh? Torque converter seal, you're right. I mean, he said, I think he said rear main. That's why I said that. You're right. However, so you pull it out, and once you pull it out, what happens when you pull it out? Fluid runs out of the converter and kind of wets everything. You don't know if it's leaking or not. Well, I'll tell you what you better take a look at is the, you know, that button on the front of the torque converter? It goes up into the back of the crankshaft. You know, it's a big old button sticking out in front of the torque converter. Mm -hmm. That darn thing will leak. It'll leak around there. And so what you do is you get you a thick piece of rubber with a hole in the middle of it. If you're going to do this right, if you're going to make sure you don't have to pull it back out. How many of you like to pull it back out when you've already had it out once? You don't do that, do you? Mm -hmm. I, want be, I want to pull it out, put it back out, and be done with it. We're going to put that thing, air pressure on it. And you're going to put air pressure on that darn thing, I mean, right there where the, you know, hole in the converter is where your turbine shaft is, goes and all that stuff before the pump is. You put air pressure on it and you see if it leaks anywhere. Because you may well need a torque converter. All right, here's another thing. If the torque converter is leaking there, you better have a look at the flywheel. I mean, the flex plate, because it may be cracked around the bolts. See what I mean? So don't get messed up where you just, and I've seen people do this, pull the transmission out, 
put a seal in there, put it back in, it's leaking just like it was. And it turns out it's leaking from behind that, and then when you get a check, and like I said, the flex plate's cracked, too, you know, so there's there's a lot going on there. You'll be re We've seen that here, uh, believe it or not. Okay, so, uh, let me see. Uh, in a synchro mesh transmission, the gears slide into and out of engagement. This is talking about a manual transmission. Do they or do they not? Do the gears, do the gears, the gears, I'm talking about the, the, the gears that are actually doing the pulling, are they actually sliding in and out? No. No, they're not. Uh, reverse is an exception, but that ain't a synchronized gear either. You ever notice how when you put it in reverse, sometimes it won't go in reverse, you got to let off the clutch and mash it again to get it to drop in there? Yeah, that's mine, mine just goes... <laughs> yeah. He's ruined it, so he messed it all up. You probably won't be able to get no transmission or anything for that old bomb you're driving anyway. <laughs> all right. Thanks for the comment. <laughs> well, it's a cool looking car, but it's a bomb, you know. All right. It even looks like a bomb. It's the shape of a bomb. Have you noticed this car is shaped like a bomb? All right. What, what kind of car is that? NX? Is, is that an NSX or what? what is it? NX. NX, yeah. It's a Nissan NX. It's a crazy thing. Um, a large gear ratio multiplies torque. No, excuse me. The number of internal shafts in a manual transmission depends on the number of forward speeds. Well, that's actually false because you're typically going to have two shafts, you know, if you don't count the reverse one. Or ever, uh, even if you have a three-speed or a four-speed or a five-speed. Yeah, and, uh, and we're not talking about the Fuller Road Ranger stuff at Eddie and them eating transmissions down there. We're talking about cars. A large gear ratio multiplies torque. Um, is that true? Yeah, larger gear ratio meaning like four to one, right? Four turns of the engine and one turn of the drive shaft, you're going to multiply torque that way. In a low gear, the drive gear has fewer teeth than the driven gear. Uh, that increases torque and reduces speed to the drive wheels. The drive gear is going to have more teeth than the driven gear in it. Okay, here we are. I'm going to send those guys to see the principal over. All right. Uh, the most torque is needed when the vehicle is moving quickly. Uh, what does it mean when I've got a, uh, somebody tell me, if I says, uh, you know, you're talking to somebody and you say, if they tell you they got 411 gears in the in the rear end of their truck or whatever, what exactly does this 411 mean? Four point one one turn to the drive shaft to one turn of the wheel. Everybody got that? Four point one one turn. So the more turns of the drive shafts, is that uh, give you more power or less? And so if you've got more drive shaft turns to one turn of the wheels, is that more, is that more torque or less torque? Huh? Stand it up. I mean, if the wheel's turning fast, you're already at high speed. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, for like a 373, uh, the lower, the, the higher those numbers go, the more you've got, you know, there. More torque, the higher the number. Yeah. And actually, you got a lower gear. You're, that's why the hot riders want to take off quick. All right. Let's hurry up. Um, when the driver shifts the transmission into high gear, engine speed increases. Of course. No. False. True. Whatever. Come on, somebody. That's false. 17. The synchronizer sleeve connects the transmission to the shift lever. That's false. The sleeve is actually the part that slides, but the fork is on there, right? Okay. Cable linkage is the most common type of transmission shift linkage. That's false. Actually, you have cable linkage, but it's not the most common type. Uh, before disassembling the transmission, you should inspect each component for damage and wear. Before? Please. You can't do that. And finally, number 20, the installation process for a transmission is the same as the removal process. Ha! Huh, that's a joke. That's false, isn't it? All right. Anybody got any? Uh, 14? In low gear, the drive gear has fewer teeth than driven gear. Yeah, it's false. All right. 15 and 16? Yeah. All right, you guys, we got lucky and got early, uh, got done early today. You get to take a slightly longer lunch. I'll see you back here at 1 o'clock.